What's up, H-Town? Welcome to the Believe in Astros podcast, your home for all things Astros, with your hosts, sports writer Jeff Balky and Astros broadcaster and former third baseman Jeff Blob. Now, here's Balky and Blubber. What's up, Astros fans? Welcome to episode 51 of the Believe in Astros podcast on the Believe Podcasting Network. Spring training games are underway in Florida and life is good. I'm Jeff Balky, alongside my partner Jeff Blum, who's joining us from the Sunshine State in West Palm Beach, spring training home of the Astros. Uh, I'm sure he's all... uh, I'm sure, Blum, you look like you're in a nice hotel. You got the spring training hat on. You're probably cooling down in that that AC. Oh, yeah. How are you? Shut them blinds, turn it down to about 50... Hey, hey no. that that is the 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 process I am in right now. That's why I've got a hoodie on right now. Because if I was outside, <laughs> I'd be sweating, enjoying every minute exactly. of the sun. And uh, when I come indoors, definitely crank down the the, the uh, AC and put on a sweatshirt and kind of chill out a little bit. That's how it has to go. You find us on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and of course YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe to keep up with us. Give us a follow on Twitter at Believe in Astros. You can find me at Jeff Balky, Blummer at Blummer27. You can find us pretty much anywhere on social media under those names. Thanks to everyone who's given us five stars and left reviews on Apple. Please continue to do so. Obviously, send us your comments and questions. We love seeing all of them. Read them all. For example, <laughs> when you were interviewing T.O., did he do any push-ups in the booth to prove he was still strong like he did on his driveway that one time? <laughs> Hey, dude, that dude has still got it. And you know what's crazy is, you know, you get to talk to a lot of athletes. You get to talk to a lot of ex-athletes. He yeah. exuded competitiveness, I'm not you know, and, and that's what I love about uh, Terrell Owens is the fact that he just wants to compete, and he, he looks like he could still play. I mean, this guy's a, a freak of nature, and the only reason I didn't ask him about the push-ups is because <laughs> – I probably would have tried to keep up, and he would have blown the doors off me. So I saved myself the embarrassment. <laughs> nice. Well, that's probably a good move. T.O. looks like – I saw the pictures from the booth. He's a he's a, a large man. Yeah. I mean, oh, he is and a, by the way, his hands just engulfed mine. I mean, that's why he was catching everything. I know, no doubt. So um, how is the how are the first broadcast going? I've, I've listened – I listened today, uh, and it sounded like everything was – Going swimmingly, sound in mid-season form. Well, I appreciate you saying that because what it, you know, it's a duck on a pond. Everything on the surface looks calm, cool, collected, kind of drifting along, enjoying the weather in the in the game. And underneath, there's there's a lot of parts that are flailing about. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you you get you know, Todd is my partner. Todd Callis is so prepared, and yeah. I seriously feel like he's left about. 60 to 70 percent of his notes on the table when these games are over so quick and you and everything is so abrupt that you have a hard time getting in you know some of the numbers and some of the information the yeah. stories you want to tell and that's where we're kind of adjusting a little bit but today right. actually our third broadcast felt a little more normal and i think the game was two minutes two hours 19 minutes wow. and uh it, it felt almost normal you know, so I hope yeah. that he's starting to find his groove because that's that's who you worry about the most is the play by play guy trying to set up the game. And one thing, if I don't know if you notice, and for viewers who are listening to us, when you continue to watch these games, watch how few replays we show. You know, Blummer, it's so cool that you mention that because that is an, an a topic that has not really been talked about at all. We've talked a lot about how this is going to affect hitters how it's going to affect Mm -hmm. pitchers, how it's going to affect the catcher. But we haven't really talked much about how it's going to affect fans and their experience of the game. I mean, we say, oh, well, fans will stay in their seats more often, and maybe they will, although, you know, when nature calls, you got to go. But Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to TV, yeah, like fewer replays, fewer opportunities to sort of, you know, I know there are some people who don't like the the banter. Well, we have a few people who don't like our banter. But it's like, you know, that's nah. the that's the great <laughs> fun of baseball, right? Is yes. that you get to talk about these things and sort of go over them. It's not this like fast paced, like slam you bam kind of thing like in basketball where you really just gotta call the game and move along. And that's one of the great things about that. So I, I'm I will be interested to talk to you about that and see kind of how it's impacting since it's mm-hmm. on my list to talk about the about the pitch clock for sure. 
Yeah, and just speaking of hitters, it, actually the game is what we're worried about too. You know, I'm, I'm still I'm still curious to see. It's too early in spring. Pitchers are way ahead of hitters. Then you add the clock yeah. into it, so it's going to rush the process a little bit. But pitchers look great. It seems like they're adapting well enough. Some guys you can tell get a little rushed, and they just need to take a deep breath and get get their mechanics right, and they look very yeah. good. Hitters look like they're adapting. And, you know, talking to Josh Miller, the pitching coach for the Astros, talking to Troy Snicker, the hitting coach for the Astros, they continue to say, these are the rules, we're going to adapt, that's what we do. We've been adapting for, you know, six, seven years to the rules that we are, we are inclined to uh, play in, and yeah. they're going to just try and go out there and do what they're supposed to do, which I think is uh, a great insight into the mentality of this team, too. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, I think it's 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 super fascinating. Um, let's let's quickly. I'm gonna I'm gonna just get this out of the way so we can mm-hmm. move on. Last week, <laughs> you inadvertently <laughs> created a little bit of controversy, man. When you said, I think the key that, word is triggered. Yeah, you, I think there were some triggered. There were some there man. were some real triggered people who said who were shocked and appalled and aghast. At when they heard you say Dude, that Derek man. Jeter wouldn't be able to use, play under the pitch clock because he couldn't hold his hand up. Now, I know that it was a joke. You know that it was a joke. Any person with any level of sense probably knew it. But mm. it got some attention. So, uh, yeah. comments? Well, <laughs> first of all, you know, you're, we, what you, just, you just said it. You know, you're not going to please everybody all the time. Right, And we know there's a certain demographic in the great Northeast that if anything comes out of the Southeast Houston, it's just going to be, oh, blasphemy, and, uh, you know, yeah. so there's going to be this overreaction. But I did kind of get a kick out of it because I wanted to respond a couple of times to tweets, but I was like, this is funny. I go, why, why, are, they, why are they reacting this way? It's like, that was the dumbest thing that's ever been said, you know, and I, I said <laughs> it on purpose. Because right. we were talking about the umpire and how they're going to handle hitters. Right. And the hitter can't put their hand up and call timeout. Guess who else did that? I did. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I would put my hand up Everybody and be like, give me, a, give me a chance to get ready. Um, and I, Derek Jeter is just one of the more popular guys. And I said, oh, you know, facetiously. And if you don't know what hyperbole is, go look it up. Um, and, and, you know, and you kind of had tongue in cheek. I was like, oh, Derek Jeter wouldn't be able to yeah. perform in this, you know, and it came off kind of flat, maybe not as a sarcastic as I wanted to. But if you've listened to us frequently enough, yeah. you would have caught on to the fact that that was just a complete, you know, joke as I moved on to the other other uh, aspects of those rules. But having played, f- you know, having played close to 1500 games, having called a thousand games, if you listen to that comment again, you're going to go. Yeah, that guy might be smart enough to know that that is a falsity. And I know that yeah. Derek Jeter is going to put up the numbers he put up. I was I put up the numbers I'm going to put up, and let's move on. But it was kind of I, funny that it caught fire there for a little while. So, it, hey, it really like, did. You know, there's no such thing as bad press. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know who else <laughs> held his hand up? Held his hand up? Kirk Gibson in the great in the in what yeah. became the greatest home run of all time at right in that 3-2 count. I actually watched it today. Somebody posted it uh, online. It's a great and story. Watched, and and there with both legs like, you know, in tatters mm-hmm. and he he filled up the hand. So, uh I think everybody everybody gets it. But we may as well say it just like you said. Yeah. The, no well, there's uh, no bad publicity. Well, and it, it's just funny that it kind of went the way it did. But just to you know validate the point that much more, if people really thought that I meant that comment, I would have been on every talk show in New York. I would have been on every radio station. Right. I would have been I would have been interviewed by the blogs that felt the the urge to write those articles. Right. But guess what? My phone stayed silent. Nobody cared other than the people right. that got triggered. So. Well, let's let's move know. on and enjoy this season. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Derek Cheater, great. New York Yankees, terrible. Anyway, so we can, we can move on. <laughs> I know. Did you. he say it? Did he say Gosh, it? Gosh, man. Like, we're gonna, it's like that Simpsons man. episode where they where Lisa became a vegetarian, and they're like, hey, Lisa, are you going to marry a carrot? And she's like, yes, I'm going to marry a carrot. And they're like, I can't believe she admitted it. <laughs> that was ridiculous. All right. So getting off of that topic, let, let's yep. talk a little bit about what you have seen so far down there in spring training. Like, what are the things that have stood out to you a little bit? Like, what's what it, What are you seeing? I mean, we, Forrest Whitley was on the mound today. Mm-hmm. Obviously gave up a home run. Um, well, not a bad pitch, frankly. Um, 
Wynn was uh, howling out. It was, I yeah, mean, I know. Well, see, did, it was that JJ Matajevich home run, that was like a Man. pop up. That should have been caught on the infield. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell me what you've seen around spring training. What sort of piqued your interest so far? I have been absolutely uh, embracing some of these young guys. It's been a lot of fun. You know, going into the season with the Houston Astros, that roster is set. Pitching-wise, you know, there's going to be, you know, Hunter Brown, I think, is going to slot into that five spot in the rotation with Lance McCullers not being able to make make that opening day start. So that's interesting. Forrest Whitley today was fascinating to watch because we really haven't seen him, you know, yeah. come out and be healthy and be aggressive. And he's getting the opportunity, which I appreciate Dusty and Josh Miller giving him that chance. You know, we saw the arm slot drop a little bit and he had some arm side run today. The slider was a little bit, maybe a little bit flat, but it was still mm-hmm. chasing across the plate and getting some swing and miss. And I thought he I thought he looked okay, you know, for a first outing, understanding the pressure, you know, a year removed from Tommy John. There was a lot going on there. I want to see how he adjusts in his next outing, and I think that might be a bigger story for Forrest Whitley, who got that the first couple of innings out of out of the way and uh, under his belt. Um, yeah, uh, Justin Dearden. Yeah, I've, let's talk about this kid, right? Th- this is these. You know, there's some good stories coming out of this for young guys that are kind of in a log jam in this organization. Right. But Justin Dearden is now two for two with two home runs, and he went to left center field with the first one, and right. he jacked one to right center field today. And I had the chance to interview him on Astro Line, and this is a this is a cerebral, athletic, and enjoyable human that plays the game. And he had some great conversations, but his swing looks great. Yeah, I, I did some looking up on him after he hit his home run yesterday. He's the I think he's ranked about twenty second in the Astros farm system in terms of prospects. Mm. The main thing with him is that is what everybody says is that he is got ton, he's got he has plenty of power. He doesn't have high exit velocities, but he swing his swing plane is perfect, right? So he's he hits a lot of balls in the air. Yep. Um and as a result He's going to hit some balls out. He also has a he has a, not a great strike to walk ratio. He strikes out about twenty five percent of the time, which is not great. But mm-hmm. he did he had a little bit of a slump in AAA. But essentially, in every place he's been since he was drafted, his numbers are good. You know, you just can't mm-hmm. really deny that he's a gamer. He gets in there and plays. Now, again, I think they're going to need to see a little more time from him out of AAA. He didn't he. He only played a little bit at the end of the season last year and didn't do great. But mm-hmm. if he can bring his numbers up at AAA, there's no reason why they couldn't find spots for him, especially injury replacement and things like that uh, in the outfield. I agree. And you know, and it's kind of interesting that you bring up some of those strikeout numbers and the approach that he has because I had a chance to talk to him, and he's, a, he's an analytic hitter. So he appreciates some of the data that he gets in return, you know, launch angles, vertical bat angles, some of this, some of these mm-hmm. techniques these guys use. And then you get into the mindset when he gets in the box and he said flat out, I go, what, you know, when you get in the box and how do you control the zone? He goes, I'm thinking hit first. And so that kind of explains the aggressiveness and that, mm-hmm. that will develop into selective aggressiveness the, yeah. the older he gets some of the more pitchers he faces and the experience and he'll be, he'll be just fine, but he he's got a, the, the head on the shoulders is in the right place. And now you're starting to see some of that ability come about, but uh, good points on the stats because uh, he's a guy that will be high on base, a decent amount of slug, but he, mm-hmm. you, there's still going to be strikeouts when you're young and aggressive. Absolutely. His OPS is like tremendous. I mean, he was, his OPS was over at 900 Corpus in the last two years, right? Well, his Something OPS crazy. at Corpus Christi was over a thousand. So I mean he's he's de- and he's been over a thousand few times throughout his uh, minor league career. Again, he just sort of flattened out at AAA, but um, you know th- this is a this is definitely a kid who could be in the mix for getting some. I you know especially an injury DH role something like mm-hmm. that. He's only I guess he's twenty four maybe twenty five at this yeah. point, so he's still pretty young. Um, he's he's got a lot of life, and let's be honest. I'm sure the Astros are happy to have him in the in the you know the mix for all these guys, but also let's be he's also being seen by other teams. And oh yeah, these are things that even if he doesn't end up carving out a niche for himself in Houston, he might be part of a deal that where he could get time elsewhere. I mean, these are the things that happen particularly in spring training. 
Oh, absolutely. You're you're on display, especially if you're one, and one of these young guys is playing in an organization that has you know sol- yeah. solidified veteran stars at these positions. And you're right; it's good to have this depth, and because injuries do happen, and if you have these guys prepared and ready to get there, obviously that benefits your organization. I think there's another really good point in mentioning his age, mm-hmm. and then Forrest Whitley being 25 yeah. years old. Yep. I think you have to adjust your your age radar a little bit because some of these guys like Dearden, Corey Lee, Yiner mm-hmm. Diaz, all the some of these guys missed an entire season of 2020. Yep. So those are valuable at bats, those are valuable innings that you're missing on some of these guys as far as development's concerned. So you might see some 25, 26, 27-year-old rookies coming out of these organizations over the next couple of years. Yeah, I know you've been on that bandwagon. I co- completely agree with you. Um, so the pandemic year really changed the. I think it really changed the calculus uh, for a lot of these guys. Um, just not really being able to play for a whole year. Um, it, you know, you can't simulate that kind of action. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw uh, Marty Maldonado with the new dreads. Yeah, and looking slim and trim up there. Mm-hmm. I mean, he took a walk. Like maybe he's going to steal a base. <laughs> hey, you never know, man. He's a little bit closer nowadays. Why not give it a shot? Uh, exactly. it, it was it was good to see him. He's in great spirits. Uh, you know, he's got the new look. He's always been kind of on the cutting edge of of hair styles and colors. Uh, but apparently, his daughter, his oldest daughter, really enjoys the the, the dreads that he's got now. So those might nice. stick around for a while. But he did he he did look different on on TV and in person. And I had no idea. How and how much pain he was playing through in yeah, that World you mentioned Series. that on the that broadcast. That was remarkable. Today. Tell me a little bit about that because I heard you mention that on the broadcast, but I didn't hear the whole bit. Like, yeah, what, well, what? I, who knew he had a sports hernia? I mean, I, he right. still felt like he was moving, but he had you know broken hand. He had several things going on, and he almost he almost said at the end of Game Six when they finally won uh, the World Series at the end of last season, he almost said, "I don't know if I could have gone for a Game Seven. So. It was kind of a blessing that they won in game six. But that's another thing that I think is going to change his attitude a little bit. And he's going to show some of that youthful exuberance again because he's 100%. I mean, he hasn't been like that in a long time, apparently. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, uh, sports hernia, my goodness. Being a catcher. Squatting behind the plate. Catcher, yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine what kind of like that's that sucks. Um, also, Jose Altuve with a couple strikeouts. So I, I'm assuming we can just count him out for the rest of the season, right? He's, yeah, he's, he's going to stay. He's, he's terrible. He's washed. Oh, that, I didn't mean that. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> I, Jose exactly. Altuve is going to be fine. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, is there anybody that you haven't seen yet that you're interested to see? Um, you know, it was. It, I'd have to think about it because so many of these guys are so good. Um, it was interesting to see David Hensley working out at first base. I haven't seen Michael Brantley yet, but everything is pointing to him being ready opening day, which is yeah, that's what I read. Is, today. is ahead of schedule for me, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. And Omar Lopez during an interview today at our game said that he's actually been working him at first base. So you never know. Uh, I want to see a little more of Jose Abreu just because I'm such a huge fan. Yeah. Um, that guy just is just violent s- when he pitches. He's so like even like just no an Jose outing. Abreu the first baseman not oh we the first baseman sorry. sorry no we sorry, saw sorry. Brian hey Brian today Brian came out and just went whap, 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 I know and walked off I the s- mound I was like I was, okay he's real I saw that I was like <laughs> this is bro it's spring training you can yeah. take it down and not take a She's break like, on these guys he's like man. no no thank you sorry uh-uh. yeah Jose Abreu for you're right yeah yeah we haven't seen enough of him I'm so ready to see some of him in the box for sure yeah. See him going, uh, you know, Jordan's going to take his time. There's some, some issues with the hand again with him. But, uh, you know, I want to see – we saw Yiner Diaz gun down a, play, uh, a base runner today, which was great. So great. he's advancing. Corey Lee is in great shape, you know. And then uh, I want to see more of Jake Myers. I want – Yeah. He, he, last year he was a little tentative with that arm. I want to see if the, the governor's offer, if his mind is in the frame of, I'm fine, I'm going to let it go, we're going to continue to play hard, yeah. and then we're going to see what happens. That's, that's probably the biggest thing for me is I want to see Jake Myers kind of let it go. Yeah, well, Chassie Fizz had a hit today. So he's, he's, kidding. he's uh, doing his thing, which is good. I mean, look, competition is great in spring training. The yes. more people you have uh, competing for spots, the better it is. Um, so I'm I'm down with it now. Obviously, a huge storyline of this week, and especially over the weekend, was the was the the pitch clock. 
and um, mm-hmm. we saw the game end on a third on a strike. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, unbelievable Braves and Mets I think it was I can't remember who the other team Braves I know it was uh, Red Sox I think Braves and Red Sox and and you know that's obviously the far extreme of this um, but you know Kyle Tucker said he feels a little rushed in the box I think if you watch some of the hitters you can tell they feel a little there's not that sort of flow that I think a lot of them have yeah. um, how do you think I mean obviously they're going to adjust I mean these are these are professional athletes, but how long do you think it's going to take them to really get into the get used to this? I, I think it's going to take the entirety of spring because a lot of these guys, the Jose Altuve's, the Kyle Tucker's, uh, even some of the pitchers, they're going to go play in the WBC where the clock isn't going to be there. Right. You know, there's other some some other unique rules within the WBC, but then they're going to have to come back and readjust to that. And to your point about Jose Altuve today, he's always aggressive. But watching him in that first at bat as a leadoff hitter, he's always digging a nice little toe hold when he gets in the box. And he was, I mean, he basically ran to the box today, started jamming his foot down there, trying to create a little toe hold for himself. And then he swung at the first pitch immediately. So there's moments of abruptness, but I do think that these guys are going to be able to adapt. Uh, It's just how do you do that? You know, Tucker's going to have to grab that dirt a little bit quicker, rub it a little bit faster. And... To be brutally honest, you know, I, I it, it just feels, and when you watch this game in person, you'll see the same thing. Because when you start to yeah. see the clocks and you start to watch everything outside of the camera angle, yeah, it feels abrupt and guys are constantly, you know, you know, it's almost this paranoia about the game. But for me personally, it just feels about three to five seconds off. It feels like mm. if you would have said 20 seconds with nobody on, 25 seconds with runners on, mm. I think we would have found that happy medium instead of just you know tearing into 15 seconds and 20 seconds. Well, it's certainly done what baseball wanted it to do, which is cut down the time of games. I mean, I was looking Ooh, at the games man. this weekend. We're like two hours and 20 minutes. I mean, like we had a look, 206. There was a 206. <laughs> Who had game, that? The game? second game we broadcast was two hours and six minutes. We looked at each other and like, what do we do now? <laughs> right. That's a. That is a. See, that's a whirlwind to me. I. And maybe they, maybe baseball will start to see that maybe they went a little too far. Maybe they'll trim it back a little bit or something. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's obviously going to be quite an adjustment um, for a lot of these guys. I think the pitchers, you, like you said, I think pitchers are having an easier time, and I think they will have an easier time with it than the hitters. Um, I think hitters, it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird for some of these guys. Like mm-hmm. Jose Altuve is going to have to, you know, get those like. Uh, no, the the batting gloves unhook them and hook them back up. You know, get that velcro working quick. He's not gonna have yeah, straighten out that hat. He's not gonna have, <laughs> he's not gonna have much time. Man, he's like so. Speaking of things that are going to uh, change the uh, uh, calculus for certain hitters, Manny Machado. Woo! What is going on? The the San Diego I thought the Padres. gold rush was like in Northern California. All of a sudden, San Diego they they struck gold down there somewhere. Listen, San Diego, so founded yes. by German settlers. Um, I, you know, San Diego has spent a billion dollars in the off season on guys. Machado gets ten years, and just what three years ago, four years ago, he signed mm-hmm. a, 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 you know, a ten year. Yeah. That's what it was—a ten year deal. Then he gets like an eleven year extension. Yeah. yeah, he gets an eleven year extension. Now that's going to take him until he's 41 years old. Who thinks that Manny Machado is still going to be even playing at 41 years old? Well, the dude's still going to hit. He's going to hit for until he's 65. That dude can rake. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. But Gosh. I mean, what the thing that now is, you're like, I, you know, last week Jose Altuve was like, "I want to be an Astro for life," and they're like, "What about you, Alex Bregman?" They've said they want to keep you, and he's like, "Maybe." You know, and it's he's, kind of he's like, like, "Did you see what they did to that guy in San Diego?" Yeah, so I mean, it's like. <laughs> Who blames any of these guys? Like, you've got him no. and, of course, Kyle Tucker. This really changes a lot of for the Astros in terms of what they're going to mm-hmm. do about contract situations. You know, the Astros are adamantly against these double-digit years uh, for deals, and rightfully so. But, man, competing for the best players in the league is getting tougher and tougher. 
Yeah, it's pretty amazing that these years and these numbers are continue to escalate. You know, uh, I, heard, I saw a tweet that basically said that Manny Machado's deal has turned into a 15-year, $450 million deal, dollar deal, which is remarkable. And he said it in spring wow. training. He completely manipulated the situation by saying, hey, the market's changed. I'm going to opt out. And, yep. uh, you know, A.J. Preller said, well, let's talk about it. And whatever money they had allocated for Aaron Judge, they completely shifted and put it right on top of Manny Machado. But, again, I, how is San Diego going to handle Juan Soto when he's up for free agency? Right. Are they going to think about keeping him? Is Are they going to be able to bring pitching in? It, it's, it is, it's fascinating to watch what they're doing. But it's kind of funny that. San Diego, the only show in San Diego, right. kind of called across the nation and said, hey, Steve uh, Cohen, hold my beer. Check this out. And they <laughs> exactly. let it rip. But man. Well, it's not like they're not as rich as Cohen, you know, either. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a weird, it, it, you know, as, as somebody said in an article I was reading today about the Machado deal, they said uh, that sound you hear is uh, the Major League Baseball Players Union hanging up on the owners when they ask for a salary cap. It's like, well, you know. <laughs> Come did on. you did you see the quotes? I mean, it was it was almost immediately after that signing, and and after some of those quotes, that Tony Clark showed up and said, "We will never have a salary cap," and I was like, "Mic drop, see you later." Well, I who can blame him? Listen, yeah. you know, you and I have talked about it on here, but this is all the owner's fault. You know, this is not <laughs> like keep nobody, shelling it out. Yeah. It's like it's like I we want a salary cap. Like, sure you do. Just tell your guys to stop spending all their damn money. I mean, mm -hmm. and granted, the Major League Baseball is going to be facing a problem because let's let's just be very clear about it. There are teams who can who cannot who are going to uh, spend one third of what the highest payroll teams in the league are going to spend. The Astros have good money; they're always going to be around the top seven or eight teams for sure mm -hmm. in terms of spending. But yep. there, you're looking at teams now that are going to just way outpace teams that are just never going to have an opportunity. And you can't just say, well, find another billionaire. It just doesn't work. So there's going to have, even if, even if you can't put a salary cap on these guys, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find another way to, to build some competitive balance. I mean, one of the great things about the NFL is that, you know, every year there's, there's different competition, you know, Cincinnati can be good for a while. And, New England was good for a while, and then you've got New York and Dallas and whatever, other than the Texans. You know, you've got this parody that baseball they just can't pull together because you just don't have any mm -hmm. money. And so they've got to figure out the competitive balance thing. Yeah, I completely agree because obviously, the, uh, you know, owners are are not fearful of getting past that, you know, that uh, competitive yeah, balance tax clearly. because they are just absolutely taking, you know, the stealth jet and just flying past that thing in a hurry. And I think it's going to be interesting, you know, in about seven or eight years when we look at some of these teams, are they going to be as competitive yeah. and how, you know, they're going to have to hold on to these contracts because they're not going to be able to trade them. They're just going to have to absorb these, these numbers for years to come. And it's fascinating to me to see this. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. We're not going to know what this portends uh, for at least another five, six years, maybe mm -hmm. even 10 years. And then we're going to start sitting around going, okay, now we see what the repercussions of some of these incredible deals are and, and everybody's got to deal with it, I guess. So it's, it's wild. I will mention very quickly that because we have, you know, it's your network too. We have seen that there's, there are some issues mm -hmm. with a lot of regional sports networks, including AT&T. Disney is apparently pulling their backing from AT&T that, and the regional sports network thing has been a problem for a while. Um, you know, I actually did a bunch of reporting on the, the CSN Houston uh, situation back when it was still Ooh. around before yeah. and, and how that just came unra unraveled. The bottom line is, is that when it comes to regional sports networks, a lot of these, and, and frankly, when you look at it, a lot of the deals, the TV money that's going into big deals with the Big 12 and the SEC and, you mm -hmm. know, and all these other, you know, uh, organizations, the problem is, is that there's just not enough ad money out there for a lot of these things. And yeah. so these leagues are going to have to start thinking about, and because streaming is dominating uh, yep. and people have cut the cord, you know, I, I'll never forget. I was having a conversation on Twitter with a, a an older journalist who had a, a sports guy and we were chatting back and forth about streaming uh, and how he's like, I just can't understand why people would watch things on their phone. I'm like, well, 
my niece at the time said that all the kids in her class in high school were watching the World Cup on their phones. So it's like, that's how it is. You know, whether we understand it or not, whether it's a 70 inch television or a four inch screen, people are Mm -hmm. streaming and that's the end of it. And that's the way it's going to be. And so all these leagues need to get on board. At least Rob Manford has said that he wants to get on board. He wants to, um, you know, to really make sure that anybody can watch anytime they want, get rid of the blackouts, all that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously you're kind of in the middle of it because you're a broadcaster on one of these networks. You know, what do you do? Yeah, well, you know, for for the talent and quote unquote talent, you know, myself, Todd Callis, mm-hmm. Julia Morales, you know, TK and I, truth, it, it, this is common knowledge, but I'm an Astro employee just like Todd. Yep. So there is a there is a uh, there's a certain protection in that sense that we are mm-hmm. Astro employees that you know we won't we won't become victim of whatever these these RSNs decide to do. There's right. a couple of things to unpack though when you talk about some of these RSNs, you know. It, in uh, Seattle, this the, the same same group covers the Kraken, the NHL team. So, a lot of these RSNs don't just carry baseball, and I think that might be a little yeah. bit of the issue and complication in trying to peel <clears throat> apart some of these networks. For sure. Is if you take the Astros, do you take the Rockets? You know, I don't know mm-hmm. how that works. You know, and it, if Rob Manfred comes in and says, "Well, we just want baseball," that you got to do something with the Rockets, or I don't know how that works. And yeah. obviously, the rights fees have become an issue because those some of those are so substantial that they're causing these networks to implode. And I don't know if there's a way to restructure, renegotiate. I don't know. Well, this is I a lot you, of stuff that's beyond me. It is. It is. And you're right. It is. It's very complicated when you talk about those broadcast rights fees <clears throat> for cable networks and things like that. They just don't want to pay it. There was a the, David Barron, who's an outstanding chronicle writer for many, many years. Does a lot of the, has covered sports media for a long time. He had a great rundown about saying that essentially, if you have Xfinity, you're paying about seven dollars a month for sports, whether you want to or not. That's mm-hmm. just the deal. As a subscriber, you have to pay for it. You don't have a choice. Yep. They could actually lower the cost to their subs- to their subscribers if they didn't have to carry these networks, right, and pay yep. those network fees. So it's complicated, right? Um, mm. I to me, as someone who is fascinated and and you know works in technology, I think you know you are doomed if you do not embrace what is coming. You know, yeah. if you like when you see these uh, directors in Hollywood saying that they. Like I would never release a film on Netflix. All right, well nobody's going to go to the movies anymore, bro. Yeah, don't so get you paid. might, you know, so you might want to consider it. Okay, Martin Scorsese, that's cool. If you don't want to do it, you can't. But what about these guys who are making films on their iPhones? Right? It's a Literally. real deal. Like it has democratized so much. As someone who's been a musician his whole life, I can tell you, not having to spend money at a giant recording studio to make quality recordings completely alters the landscape of writing music. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, you just have to embrace it. I feel like baseball, I will give baseball a lot of credit because they definitely have been at least on the edge of making some of these changes, particularly with radio. Like you can get radio now, like they've made good deals with Sirius XM. So like I remember driving across country and listening to Astros games, you know, the, you know, listening to, uh, uh, Robert Ford and uh, Steve Sparks. So, mm-hmm. I, I, to me, I feel like they they under they get it. Whether they can untangle all that money and all that contract language, God. good lord, it's that's something lawyers will have to deal. With. I think that's really the whole reason they have contracts in the first place to pay the lawyers. Wasn't man no, for the y- lawyer? <laughs> oh man, good lord. Uh, yeah, you know, you're right. About, it's about the money. It's complicated. And you, you mentioned something earlier. That I think a lot of a lot of listeners, viewers, whoever's watching and listening to this need yeah. to understand that hopefully this pushes in the direction of getting rid of blackouts for the gut for oh. God's sakes, because that would be great for everybody. And the second thing is, is it is not easy. I know that I've, I've, I've found this out over the decade I've been in the booth It is not easy to put a production together and get it on air. Yeah. It is, you hear us, you see us, but there is a group of people behind us that we absolutely adore, and they work their brains out to make sure that this product that we put out there is worthwhile and giving us the opportunity to speak on a clean mic, to have a great visual when we're watching the game. So that's where I'm kind of concerned because a lot of those those people who work in the truck Mm -hmm. and a lot of the tech, you know, the... uh, 
uh, TD, the technical directors that we have that mm -hmm. actually plug things together to put the show on, those are the ones you worry about. Some of them are independent contractors. Some yeah. of them are, are, are employees of the RSNs. You know, yes. where does where do they land? And that's 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 going to be tough. That, that I think that's going to be the hardest part about this whole situation. I for agree me. completely. Like I do know some of the like some of the guys that work and freelance and do those things at Minute Maid and and at other places. You know, running cameras, running boom mics. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, coiling cable. You know, all the Man. stuff that is. It's just grunt work, but it does it does take skill. So necessary. It yeah, takes and skill. it does take skill. It takes a lot of skill. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you and look, I'm gonna tell you right now. This is a little secret. If you don't know how to roll a cord properly, don't do it ever. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it because you will find someone will come along. And they will slice your hands off for doing it incorrectly. But if mm -hmm. you leave a bunch of kinks in a cable, oh, there's nothing that pisses off an engineer more than having to uncoil a, a terribly wound up cable. I see people wrapping around their arms and stuff. It's like, don't. Yeah, just, you can just, do that at home. Don't do it on site. It's like, do that with your, <laughs> do that with your garden hose. Yes. Don't do that with a microphone cable. Yeah, so please. Blummer, um, what what do you have? You're there in the next couple of days, right? You're back on Thursday. So you're on the radio the next couple of days. Is that right? Yeah. What's kind of cool is, uh, you know, we only do eight games on TV and the radio guys, I don't know if everybody knows this, but they broadcast, they, you know, they radio broadcast every single every spring game. training game and they go into the postseason. So these guys end up calling 200 plus games. Yeah. And anytime that uh, TK and I can give a little relief to Steve Sparks or Robert Ford, uh, we offer our services and I'm going to actually take a couple of days here and be on radio with Robert Ford, give Steve Sparks a couple of days off and uh, call some games on radio. I'll be in St. Lucie, uh, tomorrow after this podcast nice. comes out and then uh, one more game at home in uh, West Palm Beach and then I'll come home for a little bit before going back to spring training to call Team Venezuela yeah, versus the Houston right. Astros. Next Wednesday, in fact, a week yeah. from Wednesday. Um, what does Steve Sparks need time off for? I thought that guy was shot out of a cannon every morning. Like, Dude, <laughs> does he need he's to... old. He's he's tired. No, I'm just kidding. Sparky. <laughs> this is this Sparky. Guy. He's just going to be out playing golf probably for the next two days while you're just like, he will well, be resting. Dude, we did we did Astro Line last <laughs> night, me and Sparky, and uh, he's looking at his schedule. I think TK's picking him up on a couple more radio broadcasts, and he's like, wait a minute. I've got two days off in a row to go. i got to find a driving range. Yeah, he's going to be on the golf course. That's exactly. He's going to be out there hanging out, having a few, having a few brewskis, as he likes he to better. say. <laughs> he owes me that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Look, when you're a day off, you need to take him up on it. Be like, where did yeah. you find the golf course? Oh, he's Let's buying go. the first round when we get up when we get up to Minnesota, <laughs> Pittsburgh. You kidding me? Oh my God! When you guys get up to Minnesota and Pittsburgh, man, that's I'm I am really anxious to find out. <laughs> Put that hoodie up because it's gonna be. I'll lend you my uh, I'll lend you my gear I got from REI for Colorado. Say, you just came back from that environment <laughs> that we're gonna be going to. I'll lend you some stuff because man, you might need some <laughs> snow pants up in Minnesota. <laughs> Yeah. Man, oh man! All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us this uh, this Monday. We'll be back either later next this week, probably, or early next week for sure, um, with another fresh pod brought to you by Bet Online. Um, things are complex this time of year, so bear with us on mm -hmm. schedules. Who knows where we're going to be or what we're going to be doing? Um, yeah. But a huge thanks to all of you for listening and watching all over the world. Obviously, be sure to tune in to the broadcast. Catch Blummer on the radio. There's nothing better than spring training radio. Oh, I no. don't care what anybody it's says. Good. It's so good. It's like the perfect. It's like I can play that in the background. It's like it's just the absolute best. Um, thanks so much for liking and subscribing on YouTube, on Apple. Give us some five stars when you get a chance. Mm -hmm. Very thankful for all you guys. Keep it coming. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy spring training games. Go Astros.